For everything there is a season, a time for every experience under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to pause from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep, a time to discard. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. And these, these are the times we come to remember. El Harachaman, merciful God, you've taken a beloved one from us. We gather now and raise our voices in prayer to the source of life. We ask for comfort and strength and the power to move forward in life. Death has taken Ruthie from us. And our friends grieve in a world darkened for her lack of presence. Her love united all around her in life and death cannot sever that. Her companionship shared along life's path continues now. It does, through the tenderness of memory and for the gifts of her heart and her mind that are now a precious remembrance. In this time of grief, we listen to the voice of our sacred scriptures, which brings us an ever-increasing message of God's nearness, our kinship with one another in light and darkness, joy and sorrow, life and death. Eshet Chayel Miyimza, a woman of valor who can find her. She is more precious than fine pearls. Her husband trusts in her and he lacks nothing. She does him and her family good, never harm all the days of her life. She perceives her labor as rewarding. Her candle burns on into the night. She reaches out to others in need, extends her hands to them. She is clothed in strength and dignity and in this case mascara and lipstick <laughs> she faces the future with cheer she speaks with wisdom the law of kindness is on her lips her children rise up and bless her many daughters have done valiantly but you Ruthie you exceed them all Amen Dear friends, at the conclusion of our service today, we'll continue with a service of interment at Mount Olive Cemetery. Family has uh, reminded me that at the conclusion of the interment, they'll begin to receive friends at Steve, uh, Steve Mark's home on 3268 Havel Drive in Beechwood until 5 p.m. and then this evening from 6.30 to 8 p.m on Tuesday from 2 to 5 and 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. They invite you, if you wish, to honor her life with a gift of tzedakah, a contribution to Recovery Resources, 3590 Chester Avenue in Cleveland, or to Menorah Park. They, of course, invite your continued gestures of love and condolence, and your memories, the gifts of your heart and mind that have already begun to pour in over recent days. Steve linked me just last night to a page with more than 700 
comments of condolence and remembrance on social media. That's really awesome. Dear friends, contemporary Rabbi Lawrence Kushner, in his book, Honey from the Rock, taught us to notice what is happening at this portion of the winter season, particularly in Cleveland, where snow trades off with rain, warmth with frozen cold and partial thaws. And what seems like will be a lasting snow, often within a short time, is no longer there. He tells of walking home on a Friday night with the unequal joy of making the only footprints in new snow. Occasionally, Rabbi Kushner would turn around and walk backwards to see the path he had created with his steps. But later, warmed up by rain and the warmth of the sun, when he'd returned to the path, there wasn't even a trace of the steps to be found. So he began to search moment to moment for his former steps and discovered that with the right effort and desire, it was as if his footprints remained. Perhaps, he says, something similar happens when people in our lives die. There are traces people leave behind them as they walk through the universe. Traces that cannot be eradicated. Through kings and wars and violence, the traces tell. They tell the story, even when the snow melts and the seasons turn. I share this teaching on a mournful Cleveland winter day because of our shared purpose here. We gather in this gentle space to consider the footprints that have left a mark in this world because someone very precious, Ruthie Marks, walked on this earth. She has died to be sure. We will need to use all our effort and earnest desire to see the footprints that she made. But she lived. She surely lived. Yesterday as I sat with her son Steve and his Cheryl, with grandson Aaron and his Rebecca, granddaughter Alyssa, on behalf of her and Nick, with Jamie, her nephew, and of course, the absolute apple of her eye, great-grandson Edison, who it can't be described as him sitting with us. Rather, he searched around my office for toys made for a toddler. But in the hour or so that we gathered, everyone marveled to me about how beautifully and how vivaciously Ruthie Marks lived and offered to the people around her a profoundly loving energy. We are here in this mistake, in this space by no mistake. Ruthie wanted and strived in her life to make her force, her life force, one of unity, joy, goodness, and affection. If she were able to sit and talk to us today, she would encourage us to see her as a person who touched this world for the sake of love. There's so many others in her immediate family that time and distance made it impossible for me to connect with before this service. So our sympathies extend today to her son Bruce and his Nancy, to Allison and her Scott, Stephanie and Whit, and to great-grandson Ethan as well. We pray together that God will be with the entire family and hear them and let them each draw meaning from communities of shared purpose. For Ruthie's sake, they will know there is strength in faith and that a good name, a name such as the one she earned, one that conveys righteousness and truth, well, that will last long beyond her death. Ruthie was born in the early part of the winter of 1926. She just marked her 91st birthday on December 18th. She was the older of the two children of David and Dina Leibovitz. Her and her sibling Merle, Alav HaShalom, both grew up here in Cleveland. Their parents were first generation immigrants from a village in Hungary called Danielovo, at the border where Hungary meets, at the time, Czechoslovakia and Romania. The very idea that their daughter would adopt so beautifully the culture of this community and nation was amazing to her parents. They watched her thrive in Glenville, educationally and socially. Her smile 
glowed when people who reconnected with her or with her children or children-in-law later in her life spoke about how Ruthie had been so beautiful and had so many suitors and even in high school was the homecoming queen in Glenville. Indeed, that was among the blessings of having been the last of her generation. At Meyer's apartments where she lived the majority of these last years since her beloved husband Morty's death, she reconnected with several people who knew her as a young woman before even the concerns of marriage and young motherhood and making a home. She never expected it. In fact, she was pretty sure she would hate it there. But Myers became a place of rekindled joy and life spirit after sustaining the loss of her husband. She helped to run the sundry shop at Myers, headed a dinner group that included many people that were newly dear to her only in recent years and months who loved her as though she was a friend that they had known forever. With age, she couldn't do some of the things she used to do with her friends, like her B'nai B'rith Bowling League, from which she retired as she began her eighth decade, or the regular card games with her girlfriends that Steve remembers, overhearing as a child his mom's laughter and great fun with her friends as they played pan and poker and gin rummy in a cigarette smoke-filled room like they were high rollers in Vegas often playing all night long. That didn't matter, though, because Meyer's apartments and the Menorah Park campus in recent years and months were her home. Even just a few nights ago, deeply weakened by the frailties of age and poor health, she rallied. She rallied to be strong enough to get home, to be at home with her family and caregivers at her side, as she breathed her last. In truth, I did not get to know Ruthie during her lifetime, not in its fullness, but in hearing the family share with me more about her final days and ultimately the humility of her final hours, I hope to have absorbed a bit of her essence. For even when she appeared to be at her weakest, she'd rise up again for yet more opportunities of laughter and affection. Like very few people are granted, she was, it seems, completely aware that her death was imminent. She kissed you and greeted you with a serenity that was uniquely hers. And you, her family, gave her sweet treats like apple cider and ice cream. And when she asked for hot fudge, magically, you and your friends at Menorah Park made it appear. But it was you who received the sweetness of the prize of the final moments of her long life. And today, when we go to Mount Olive, we pray that if there is some kind of sweet reunion of souls after this life, that she will commune there forever in the company of her Morty, alongside whom she shared the best years of her marriage and life. As well, she'll have tales to tell to the many friends who predeceased her including her dear daughter-in-law, Randy, who tragically and at too early an age died and laced at rest there. Steve was sure to tell me what an incredibly strong and beautiful bond that his mom made with Randy, how it saddened her to survive her daughter-in-law's death. That's no surprise to you. As Rebecca said to me the other day, if you were even, and I'm using her term, affiliated with one of her family members, you were like gold to her. She'd show you her quirks. You'd get more than a glimpse of what a big sugar junkie she was. And not just for dessert treats, no. Ruthie would eat honey by the spoonful and jelly by the packet. She'd ask after Rebecca's family or Cheryl's family or her friends' families, and treated the people in their lives with kindness and care. Alyssa tells me they called their grandmother Mama, and she loved to treat them like they were her best friends. Alyssa says that Ruthie could keep a secret like no person she has ever met. She lived to hold on to the wishes and aspirations and highest hopes of her grandchildren, 
and even died with one of those secrets, the knowledge of the name of her next great-grandchild, something no one else knows but her. Alyssa and Aaron remember the wonderful feeling of knowing because of how near and distance they lived that Grandpa Morty and Mama were very close to them. They were the first destination for visits on holidays and they were the top babysitters when the parents went out of town. Aaron spoke to me about how over the top Ruthie was in expressing her love. Even if you didn't see her for a while, if you got a card or a voicemail message from her, it would include big X's and O's made up of hundreds of little X's and O's, like she was the original micro calligraphy artist. Aaron said that his grandmother took the idea that we grow up with in the Jewish community of loving others, even beyond ourselves, and ran with it to the highest possible level. On visits to Meyer's apartments, one had to get ready for a show because Ruthie would swagger through the halls, showing her grandkids off to her friends and showing herself off to her grandkids. Not just the way people would smile at their neighbor who was nearly 90 and longer with her eyelids smudged with mascara and her trademark red lipstick and her clothes put together just so. But how her stroll through the building was a way of saying to others, I'm still here and I'm thriving. Her nephew Jamie told me that visits with his aunt were similarly filled with her gregarious and outgoing presence born of the same roots of the Hungarian hospitality she knew from her parents, from Grandpa Dave and Grandma Didi. He and Steve both remarked to me of how proud Ruthie was of the write-up she received as resident of the month one time at Myers. They had the story from the building newsletter made into a plaque that hung beautifully on her wall and was a source of great joy and which stays as a reminder to them of how even after needing to be resilient through the storms of life, the loss of her husband, and the many health setbacks over recent years, it was, it was, it seems, as if Ruthie knew, even after the storm, where to look in the sky for the rainbow. Steve's relished being able to do for her the things that his dad used to do, keeping track of her budget and helping her shop for the things she'd need and taking care of things that might need to be done for her. He felt indebted to her as a strong example to him growing up and had really come full circle in the sense that the son was now doting on the mother the way a parent might a child. He remembers how growing up what a great and encouraging mom she was. His various commitments as a student and a swimmer on a travel team meant that one of his parents had a great deal of driving and organizing and dropping off to do. And his dad was largely focused on being the breadwinner for the family. So Ruthie became that driver and of all the social and household aspects of motherhood, Steve remembers growing up in a home that was welcoming and open and hospitable to friends, friends who could confide in his mom sometimes better than their own. Steve looks back on his mom's life with tremendous admiration for how she lived, followed through on her various interests. Although she loved being at home with her kids, she also loved the contact with people that she accrued when she worked at the apropos boutique at Beachwood Place. She enjoyed, as I mentioned earlier, bowling and playing cards, but she also taught herself to paint and appreciated the arts and culture, and holidays and traditions. Speaking of Jewish tradition, I wish to bookend this tribute with the writings of another contemporary rabbi, this time my colleague in Jerusalem, Rabbi Joel Osserin who wrote the following passage, which I hope may set an intention for us as we remember how Ruthie lived and has now died. He writes, A child asked, tell me of life. And the sage answered, life, my child, is a mystery. We do not ask to be born. We do not understand the meaning of our birth. We grow. We experience life's pleasures and pain. We love and oh so slowly realize that we have become, that we are. 
At that moment, we humble ourselves before the mystery of life and quietly say, though I knew not, I have been granted the most precious gift, the gift of life. And then the child asked, tell me of death. And the sage answered, death, my child, is a mystery too. It is a return on the gift of life, which came free to us. We live as the trustee of that mysterious being and becoming. We are trustees of life. We nurture it. We delight in it. And at the appointed time, we sadly return it from whence it came. Listen. Listen to the key phrases of that teaching. Life as a gift. A precious keepsake. Humbling ourselves before the mystery of life. These words, I pray, help convey a sense of the journey she traveled on the path just ahead of us. And that is, I pray, where her spirit is today, just ahead of us, nurturing, inspiring, humbly giving goodness to us. Let us keep our eyes all day long and in the days to come on the precious keepsake that was Ruthie Mark's life. She was physically with us, and now she lives in our hearts with the affection and gratitude she always lived. Amen. I'm honored to call on Ruthie's grandson, Aaron, to share tribute to his loving grandma. So um, there's really not enough time to talk about my grandmother, right? Um, she did so many things and she touched so many people that it's hard to really even pinpoint where to start. Um, and I thought about it all last night. I thought about all this morning. What am I going to talk about? Um, and I thought that the rabbi did such a wonderful job after meeting with us and being able to take all of our thoughts and, and deliver them to everyone. Um, and so after thinking about it, as difficult as it is, I thought that the best thing to talk about would be this week. Because, you know, our family, like other families, has seen tragedy. Um, and that's not what this was. It wasn't. We're sad. We, you know, we feel lost without Ruthie here. But it wasn't a tragedy. This week was crazy. I was very busy. I had multiple trips all over the country. And um, I met with my grandmother. Um, th I had one day in town between a trip. And I went and saw her. And this was when she was at the hospital. And I got there. And she was really not responsive. Um, you know, she was very weak. And um, it was really difficult. And I got up to leave, and, you know, I told her she was beautiful. I told her that I loved her. And I thought it was the last time I was going to see her. And um, she opened her eyes. She, you know, pulled together enough strength to grab my hand and to kiss my hand. And um, I said goodbye, and I left. And, um, you know, the hospital called my dad, and they said, you know, her her numbers are dropping, you want to get here immediately. Um, my dad rushed to the hospital, and, you know, a couple hours later, my phone starts ringing with a FaceTime while I'm in Michigan, and it's my grandma, awake, laughing, <laughs> hanging out with her family, everyone in that room, you know, just all hanging out. Um, I was like, of course, of course Ruthie would do that. Um, and so I had a couple more days in, uh, on this trip, and I came right from my last meeting. I drove right to uh, Menorah. She, she, you know, she had, again, found enough strength to get back to what she had considered home, right? That was home for her now. She wanted to be home. And uh, kind of same idea. We got there, 
and she was very weak and, and you know, not a lot of energy and, and we, you know, the family kind of gathered around her and, and we prepared to say our goodbyes and, you know, we told her how much we loved her. We told her how beautiful she was. We told her how much she meant to us. And uh, we got up to leave and, you know, we grabbed our coats and ready to go and she wakes up. <laughs> And uh, this was Thursday night, and, and she, you know, we spent almost another hour there. Um, you know, she was drinking the apple cider. She was laughing. She was, uh, you know, she was telling us how much she loved us. And, you know, it was this profound moment, right, where she, she barely had enough strength to even do anything, but, but she wanted to tell us desperately how much she loved us that she knew she was going to die and that now it's up to us you know she turned to my dad and she said it's now it's you you have to take this moving forward you know and it was one of the most beautiful experiences i've ever had in my entire life the thought that 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 you know this woman would just give every last bit of what she had to make sure that her family knew how much she loved them and how important we were to her and that we are here now to carry on her legacy and to continue that forever it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And while I can get up here and tell you a million stories about her life, that's the one I want to leave you with. I wish we can all find hope and you know grace in, the, in, in that thought and that we can all live our lives the way she did and, you know, and end our lives the way she did. So, you know, I wanted to share that with you because I, I just thought it was important. And thank you so much. And that's all I got. Will you all please rise? El male rachamim, shochen bamromim, hamtei menucha nechona tachat kanfei hashkina. Im kedoshim otorim kizohar araki amazhirim, et nishmat rochol bat David. Shalcha l'olama bal rachamim yastireha Beseter knafav l'olamim Vitror bitror hachayim Et nishmata Adonai hu nachlata Vitanuach b'shalom al mishkava Vinomar Amen God, full of compassion, eternal spirit in the universe. Grant rest now in your sheltering presence to Ruthie Marks. She has entered eternity. God, let her now find refuge in the shadow of your wings. Let her soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God, you are her inheritance, and she is yours. May she rest in peace. Amen.